Hey, would you stay standing with me for just a second? Um, tonight, if you've been coming to Young Adults for a couple of years now, you'll be familiar with our guest tonight. But if you're new, I genuinely mean this from the bottom of my heart. You are in for a treat. Um, Manny is one of uh, a really good friend of mine. He's one of my closest friends in ministry. And he has been somebody who has spoken into my life. I've learned from him both in person and afar. And when we were doing this series on deconstruction, he is literally the first person who like came into my mind of like, we need to get Manny in this room to speak. I have never met somebody who is more hungry for knowledge of God, studying God's word, and yet so passionate and relevant to make God's word understandable and, and teachable to every single person in our generation and in this room. And so tonight, I want to challenge you more than ever, would you open up your heart and lean in to what my friend has to say tonight? Would you help me in welcoming my dear friend to our stage? Give it up for Mr. Manny Arango! I am honored that you would stand up for me and clap. Well, come on, can we give some honor to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? His name is Jesus. He is the King. There is nobody like him. Your alarm clock did not wake you up this morning. The grace and the goodness of God woke you up this morning. He has delivered us and set us free. And I think every every once in a while it's good to just remember like remember what it is that God saved you from whether it was addiction whether it was a negative relationship whether it was a mental health crisis whatever it was sometimes we can be so safe for so long that we forget like exactly what it is that he rescued us from I remember one time I know none of you will be able to relate to this it's just me I was dating this like ratchet heathen girl I know y'all are perfect. All the Pharisees, you're dismissed, but. Uh, and you know, we had been broken up for a while and I was just kind of like missing her. You know what I'm saying? Nobody, just me. Okay, cool. And my best friend, I remember like venting to my best friend, like, oh, I miss her. Da, da, da. And my best friend had to like sober me up and remind me of all the toxic things that had happened. You know, a lot of times, Sin loves to be that thing that you start to like miss. Like, man, I remember when I used to be free to do whatever I wanted and smoke whatever I want and party with whoever I want. And then like you need church to grab you and go, no, freedom is not what you're free to do. Freedom is what you're freed from doing anymore. And so we gather tonight to remember the cross set me free. And this life may look like bondage to the outside world, but I understand that Jesus defines freedom in a very, very different way. I'm not free to do whatever I want to do. I'm free from the need to gratify the desires of my flesh. I'm free. So come on, all the free people, can we raise our hands? God, we love you. God, we honor you. God, we thank you that your presence is in the room. And God, we give you these next 40 minutes. And God, we ask that you would speak. God, I've got a sermon, but you have a message. So God, I ask that you would talk tonight. That God, that people wouldn't just leave here thinking, man, that guest speaker did a good job. But they would leave saying, the Holy Spirit met me on a Thursday night at a young adult service at Red Rocks Church. And the Holy Spirit said exactly what the Holy Spirit needed to say to convince me to return to truth and to convince me to get rooted in the scriptures. God, I ask that you would help us tonight. Give us grace. God, I ask that you would help me to be full of grace and full of truth. In God's name, in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, and we all said together, amen, 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 amen. You can high five your neighbor. Tell them they look good even if they don't. And grab a seat. As uh, Connor said, my name is Manny Arango. Any black folks in the room? Any black people? Come on, there's like four of y'all. That's awesome. Uh, uh, 
shout out to all the black folks. Any Hispanic people in the room? Any Hispanic people? Come on, let's go. I'm half Cuban. Uh, and so all my Hispanic family, let's go. Uh, I love preaching Hispanic churches because, like, you could be like, let's turn to Matthew chapter 4, and somebody's going to just go, Santo, Gloria a Dios. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like okay, somebody likes Matthew. That's awesome. Um, any white folks in the room? Any white folks? Let's go. We need more people shouting out white people. You realize people always shout out like minorities. No one ever shouts out white people. So like, come on, all the white people, let's go. Come on, if you're white and happy to be white, let's go. Any Asians, any Asians in the room, let's go, I think. <laughs> I think I heard somebody like, woo, and it was like fading. Um, I want to do something really, really uh, cool tonight. Um, I'm, if, who's heard me before? Anybody heard me before at Red Rocks? Awesome. There's a couple of you who have heard me before. Every time that I've come to Red Rocks in the past, uh, I typically preach because uh, I'm half black and half Hispanic. Can't really, you know, help it. I just kind of raise my voice a lot and talk fast. Uh, but tonight I've got uh, an assignment to not like preach, but to teach. So um, I'm, I hope that's cool. Preaching is awesome. Uh, preaching is communicating to the heart, which is really, really good because the Lord wants to talk to your heart. But, but tonight, like, can we, can we, like, can we deal with, like, the stuff that's going on in our minds? Is that cool? Um, I want to answer and ask three questions tonight. So if you're taking notes, you can, like, write these three questions down, okay? Number one, uh, we're just going to jump right in. The first question is this. Why is the Bible so hard to understand? Come on, we dismiss all the Pharisees. So um, can we just be real? The Bible be hard. No. Okay, cool. You guys all love it. Okay, cool. Uh, everybody's read the Bible a couple times through cover to cover and you never get bored while reading it, right? No. Can we be real? Like the Bible's hard to understand. Like, can we maybe even admit like it's awkward to admit that in church because sometimes we come to church and everyone just assumes like and everyone pretends like the Bible is just easy to understand. Like people just pretend like they floated in here and like open up the scriptures and the Holy Spirit just started talking to them. Nah, homie, guess what? The Bible's difficult. And as a pastor, can I just give you permission to admit the Bible's hard to understand? So the first question that we're going to ask tonight is like, why is the Bible hard to understand? I hope that by the end of the night, we're going to answer that question. Here we go. Number two. You ready? Second question that we're going to ask. Is it worth it? Is it worth all the work that I'm going to have to put in to actually understand the scriptures? That's the second question I was going to ask. Because since the Bible is difficult to understand, guess what? It's going to require that you're going to have to put in some work, that you are going to put in some effort. And uh, it's easy to just be a Christian your whole life and never engage with the Bible or just read your favorite books and then just pretend like Nahum ain't there. Just like, let's just pretend like that's just not even there. Like, who needs to read that? Uh, it's easy to just read Psalms and Mark, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and just rock out with John and just don't even ever read Revelation. Just watch YouTube videos about it. Um, it's, it's easy to do that, but I, I want to challenge us and I want to ask us a second question tonight. Is the work that is going to be required to become biblically literate, is it worth it? And, uh, and then the last question is this. Are we sure that the Bible can be trusted as a reliable source of truth? Are we sure that the Bible can be trusted as a reliable source of truth? I don't know if anybody's ever asked this question. I've asked this question because I grew up as a Christian. I, I, I've been a Christian, I don't even know how long. I literally like got raised in church, so I don't know how long I've been saved. I don't know if anybody's ever asked this question. Am I a Christian because I got conditioned to be one? Or am I actually a Christian because I made a real decision to be one? Like, am I a Christian? Because, I don't know, everybody around me was a Christian. Am I a Christian because it was culturally normal for me to be a Christian? Or did I actually make a real decision? In order to know that you made a real decision, you have to know what you believe and why you believe it. So if somebody can talk you out of Christianity, guess what? They should. If someone can talk you out of this, then that means you never knew what you believed in the first place. If somebody can deconstruct your faith, in a year, then guess what? Maybe it wasn't constructed all that, all that sturdy to begin with. Maybe, just maybe, we need to construct your faith in a way so that it's not deconstructible. So here we go. First question that we're going to ask, okay? Why is the Bible so difficult to understand? Number two, there's the second question that we're going to ask. Uh, is it worth it, homie? Because, like, 
dang, I'm going to have to learn some Greek words. I'm going to have to, like, get a concordance. I'm going to, like, I don't know, one verse uh, every day is going to be enough. Sorry to burst your bubble. You may gonna have to put in some work, and we're going to have to ask the question, is it worth it? Third question, is the Bible a reliable source for truth? Okay, my goal tonight in the next 36 minutes uh, is to try to answer those three questions. Who's rocking with me? Can we answer those three questions? Is there anybody, like right now, you're like, you know what? I've asked those three questions. Anybody, show of hands. I've asked those three questions. I have wondered. I have tried to read. Anybody ever try to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? Anyone, like on January 1, you decided, I'm going to do this. You got to Leviticus chapter 3. And you immediately realize, yeah, next year. Next year is the year that I'm going to do this. Come on. Has anybody, like, started a Bible reading plan? And can you admit, I did not complete it, okay? I got to Joshua chapter 3, and then I have not seen my Bible since, okay? So the first question we're going to ask is, why is the Bible so difficult? Here's the second question. And for real, no shame, plan of fitness, baby. Like, no, no judgment zone. Has anybody ever genuinely asked, is it even worth it? Is it even worth it? Because here's what you could do. You could live off sermons for the rest of your life. You could rely on somebody else telling you what the Bible says for the rest of your life and never even read it. So we have to ask the question, is it worth it? Because when Paul says this, to stop with the milk and to get meat, here's what he's saying. I need you to realize that there's no formula in the first century. There's no cow's milk. All milk, guess what, was breastfed milk, which meant that that meant somebody ate food, digested food, and held a baby to their breast and actually fed that baby milk. When Paul says get meat, he's not saying get deeper topics or get more complicated theology. Here's what he's saying. Feed yourself. Instead of letting somebody else digest information and hold you to their breast and feed you what they ate, pick up a fork and pick up a knife and feed yourself. So you could live on sermons for the rest of your life, but every sermon is milk. Every sermon. No matter how profound the message, every single sermon is milk. Because I did the work, I studied, and I'm going to stand on stage. Connor did the work, he's going to stand on stage, and he is going to feed you something. And we have grown Christians walking around saying, I left that church because they don't feed me. My son is two years old, and he's already feeding himself. So how many churches are you going to leave because they don't feed you? When are you going to actually put in the work? To get the Bible on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and feed your self. So is it worth it? Is it worth it? We have to ask that question. Last one. Who's ever asked this one? Is the Bible, how do I know that the Bible is a true and reliable source of truth? Has anybody ever asked that question? How do I know? Or am I just brainwashed, like, to believe this stuff? Because my parents are Christian and my grandparents are Christian. Is that anybody? Just me. Just me. Uh, Okay. Okay. Here we go. Let's dive in. Let's tackle the first one. Why is the Bible so difficult? Here we go. I'm going to give you a key word tonight. Everybody repeat after me. Context. I don't know if anybody's ever been taken out of context. It's the most frustrating thing in the world. Recently, I went viral on Instagram, which you may think, woohoo, hold up. Going viral is the most aggravating thing that could ever happen in your life. I went viral, and in the clip on stage, when I was actually on stage, I was talking about time and how time is a seed. And then I posted, or my team posted, a clip of me talking about this, but we didn't say time. We just said there are four levels of sowing. You reap what you sow, you reap where you sow, you reap more than you sow, you reap after you sow. This view, this video got over a million views on Instagram and thousands of comments. And after I started reading through the comments, I mean every other comment said this. I can't believe this prosperity preacher's taking up an offering in church. I can't believe this guy's talking about money. Here we go, another preacher who's talking about money on stage. And all I could do was hold my phone and scream at my screen and say, you're taking me out of I was talking about time. But guess what? We live in a 60-second world. 
where everyone gets taken out of context all the time. I wonder if you've ever been taken out of context. Like you got quoted to a friend or somebody was gossiping about you or you said something and then somebody confronted you about what you said. And come on, the cry of all of our hearts is this. If you knew the context of why I said that, when I said that, and where I said that, you wouldn't see me as a monster. You would understand exactly why I said that if you knew the So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a couple of passages of scripture and we're just going to read them. With no context. <laughs> this will be fun. And then hopefully I'm going to give you context. And we're going to see how context changes everything. The first one that we're going to read is 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 11. Somebody said, uh-oh. <laughs> 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 11. Uh, you can put it up on the screens. Uh, if there's a word that I don't say, you can kind of read the word that I don't say. Um, and, and we're just going to read this with zero context. By the way, entire denominations have been built around this verse. I would actually challenge us. Most of us aren't deconstructing the Bible. You want to know what we're deconstructing? A past interpretation of the Bible that we never took our time to study up for ourselves anyway. So here we go. Let's just read this passage. This is great. Just read this in public. Put this on Instagram with no context. <laughs> this is straight out of 1943. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a to teach or to assume authority over man. She must be she must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing. That's good. That's my favorite part of that passage, actually. Women shall be saved through childbearing. Of course, because it's 1943. This is barefoot in the kitchen. If they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Out of context, who loves this verse? Single ladies, pay attention to who raises their hand. <laughs> Don't date that guy, you know? Come on, with no context, who thinks this is a good verse? And, and I'm not exaggerating. Guess what? Entire denominations believe that women should never preach because of that passage of scripture. That passage of scripture has been taken out of context for centuries, since the day Paul wrote it. Let's put some context. You ready for some context? Here we go. Who is Paul talking to? Paul is talking to a man by the name of Timothy. Timothy lives where? Anybody know? Ephesus. Good. Timothy lives in a city called Ephesus. Ephesus is famous in the ancient world. Guess what Ephesus is famous for? Actually, Ephesus is home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, Ephesus is famous for a cult that worshipped a god, a goddess named Artemis. Everybody say Artemis. Artemis, the Artemis cult was so important in the city of Ephesus that there was a temple to the goddess Artemis, and it was called the Artemisium. So Artemis is the name of the goddess, and the Artemisium is the name of the, not just temple, but almost like the creation museum that was there. Artemis is the goddess of fertility, childbearing, and chastity. Artemis, oh, Artemis taught, and the priestesses and the teachers in her temple taught this, that Eve was created, well, that women were created first, that out of woman, that the God then creates man. That man was not created first. Also, in the temple of Artemis, you couldn't teach if you were a man. Only women could teach. The temple of Artemis would be, in our culture, would be known as like, I mean, extreme feminism. Feminism to an unhealthy extreme. Okay? So this is some context. The context is that women from the Artemisium cult have come to Timothy's church in Ephesus. And so, Paul's got some things to say. First thing he's got to say, hey, don't teach that heresy that women were made first than men. I want to be clear. Adam was created first, then Eve. Second thing that we need to correct for all of the women that come from the Artemisium, I want you to know this, that the way that you used to braid your hair to show your allegiance to the Artemis cult 
is confusing because now that you're a convert to Christ, it's really, really confusing when people see you in public because it looks like you're still a priestess or a teacher at the Artemis cult and not that you are a Christian. Here's how we know that Paul is not just talking to all women everywhere at all time in 2023 at Red Rocks Church, but that Paul is talking to a specific group with a specific problem, and he's pastoring a specific context. Is because, Timothy, if you back up and read a couple of verses, we know exactly who Paul is talking to because he tells them this about their hair their ornate style of hair that everyone would have known to be uh, a symbol of worshiping the goddess Artemis. We could throw up on the screens. It, we're just going to go to verse 9. 2 Timothy, uh, same chapter. We're just going to go back up a verse to verse 9, and it's on the screens now. Right. There we go. Also that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair, That's your part. (laughs) Or with gold pearls or expensive clothes. Guess what the Artemisium attracted? Wealthy, high-status women. We know that Paul is talking to wealthy, high-status women because poor women are not dressing with gold hair and they're not dressing with gold jewelry and they're not using elaborate hair patterns to signify their allegiance to Artemis. Is Paul saying that forever... No black girls can braid their hair? No. That's funny, because black girls braid their, anyway, okay. (laughs) Here's what every woman coming from the Artemis cult was scared of. Artemis was the goddess of what? Childbearing, fertility, and chastity, right? Childbearing, fertility, and chastity. Guess what women were scared of when they came from the Artemis cult? They were scared that since they broke their allegiance to the goddess named Artemis, that if they got pregnant, Artemis would not watch over them in childbearing and they would die while giving birth to children. So guess what Paul says to them? You'll be saved through what? This is not misogynistic at all. This is freeing to every single woman. This is saying you don't need some superstitious cult to watch over you to make sure that you don't die while giving birth to children. The God of the universe is the one who will watch over you when you give birth to children. This passage of scripture is not a passage to keep women out of the pulpit. This passage of scripture has been used by people who want to keep women out of the pulpit. And people... Instead of putting this passage in historical, cultural, and linguistic context, they just read it and say ignorant things like this. Well, let the Bible speak for itself. The Bible can't speak for itself. The Bible needs someone to interpret it. Because there's a difference between what the Bible says and what the Bible means by what it says. And all of us have been taken out of context at some point in our life. And all of us have been frustrated when we get taken out of context. Guess who's the most frustrated? God. God gets taken out of context all the time. There are entire denominations who are like, see, let just read the Bible. It says women can't talk. It's like, I could read the Bible or I could pick up a history book, bro. Or I could do the work. Because scripture means more than just quoting it for what I want. Here we go. Paul says to women, again, in 2 Corinthians, that they shouldn't talk. And this time, guess who he's talking to? Poor women. How do we know this? We know this because the instructions are very, very different. He says to them, hey, don't interrupt the preacher while the preacher's talking. Go home and ask your husband stuff if you got questions during church. Guess what the average age was for the average woman that got married in the first century? 13. Guess how old the man was? 35. Every man had an incentive to keep his wife ignorant. The more ignorant his wife was, the more he could cheat on her. The more ignorant his wife was, the Gentiles didn't educate any woman past the age of 13. 
So the reason that women in Corinth are stopping the preacher while the preacher's talking is because they are not wealthy, high-status women like in Ephesus. These women in Corinth are low-status women who probably got married at the age of 13. And guess what? I was a youth pastor for 10 years. I've told some 13-year-old girls, don't talk while I'm preaching. That doesn't make Paul a misogynist. Actually, guess who would have left church that day in Corinth when Paul said, if you've got a question in the middle of the sermon, go ask your husband. Guess who would have left mad? The men. Every man would have been like, dang. I have to now educate this woman. I now have responsibility to do what society says is absolutely ridiculous, which is to educate this woman, and I am commanded to now love her. If I love her, I won't keep her ignorant. If I love her, I will not subjugate her. If I love her, I'll act like Jesus, the only rabbi in history to have female disciples. If I love her, I will actually do the most radical thing, not what is societally acceptable, but what is countercultural because the ooh, because Christianity is the most revolutionary thing on the planet. <laughs> Keyword: context. How do we know that Paul is talking to different groups of women in Timothy versus Corinth? Context. How do we know that the women in Ephesus are wealthy? Context. How do we know that the women in Corinth are married and probably got married at a young age? Context. Here we go. Let, 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 let's take this. Let's put this one in context. You ready for another one? Is this fun? I don't know if anybody knows this. I'm a Bible nerd. In 2020, hundreds of young adults started deconstructing and leaving our church, and a bunch of people started pointing fingers at them and being like, oh, look, they're stupid. And I just decided, yeah, right, maybe we're stupid. So I went back to school to get my doctorate. By June 8th, 2024, I'll be Dr. Manny Arango. I went back to school to get my doctorate. Because if we all deconstruct the faith and walk away, we'll be left with nothing. And we got to stop like just saying things that rhyme in church. Just because it's got alliteration doesn't mean it's anointed or true. And, and maybe we need to like respect your intelligence. Because like I just explained context to you and everybody's rocking with me. Because this is actually awesome. I need a good amen if it's great. Come on, let's put this in context. Here's, a, here's another one. Here's another fun one. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Oh, no. First, yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll start reading in verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll start reading in verse 4. Let's put this one in context. This is great. Everybody's going to love this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 4. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head <laughs> that's great but every woman who prays or prophesies mind you paul says that women should pray and prophesy did, did you see that i mean he's saying to do it with your head covered but he's still saying to do it which means the same paul that said that some women should be quiet is the same paul that put a letter of romans in a woman's hand named phoebe and commissioned her to preach the gospel. The same Paul that tells women to be quiet in church also tells women that they should pray and prophesy, which means that uh, maybe we should put Paul in context. Because guess what? It's very, very fair for me to say one thing at a church in Denver and another thing at a church in Dallas. You know why? Because humans are humans. And different humans in different contexts require different things. That doesn't mean that Paul is schizophrenic. It means he's a human dealing with humans and pastoring real people in a real context. And if I want to know what he means, then I have to honor the intention of the author and uncover the original meaning to the original audience instead of being narcissistic and just asking, well, what is God telling me? Maybe instead of trying to figure out what God is saying to you, you need to figure out what God is saying to the original audience that he's talking to. Because the Bible is written for you, but it's not written to you. Ooh. The Bible is written for you, but not written to you, which means it is selfish of me 
to come to the scripture and to go, God, what do you want to say to me? That's called narcissus. Eisegesis is taking things out of context. Exegesis is putting things in a context. Narcissus is making everything about you. So unless it helps me with my anxiety, then I don't care what it has to say. Which means you're a consumer, not a Christian. Maybe, just maybe, you'll discover that when you care what the God of the universe had to say to a group of people in Ephesus, maybe you'll realize that once you uncover that, that God has something profound to say to you, and you'll be surprised that when you got unselfish, God actually began to meet your needs. Here we go. Let's have fun. Uh, verse 5. You can give me verse 5 again. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head's covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Uh, is the same as her having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her head cut off or head shaved, then she should cover her head. How many women in here with their heads covered? Just walking in rebellion. <laughs> All the women with their hair out, just, just about to bust hell wide open. Uh, actually, now we're going to skip. We're going to skip five verses and we're going to keep reading. We're going to skip all the way to verse 13. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is nah. Does not the very, does not the very nature, nature key word here, does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him. Any guys got long hair in here? Disgraceful. <laughs> Shun the unbeliever. Anyway, I feel like I just aged myself. It is a disgrace to him. But that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. Out of context, how many people did this edify today? Zero. Good. Here we go, let's put this in context. In context, we first have to go, what does Paul mean by nature? What nature is he alluding to? Uh, has anybody ever heard of like the Hippocratic Oath? Anybody ever heard of that? The Hippocratic Oath, every doctor has to take it, okay? Every single doctor on the face of, uh, at least in America, has to take the Hippocratic Oath. Everybody aware of that? Yeah, come on, give me some, you aware of that? Okay, well, the Hippocratic Oath is named after a man named Hippocrates. Hippocrates is a famous Greek uh, physician, philosopher, teacher. Uh, him and a man named Aristotle actually had a lot to say about the nature of hair. You'd be shocked as to what Hippocrates and Aristotle had to say about the nature of hair. Anybody want to know what they had to say about the nature of hair? Guess what Paul would have been referring to when he talked about nature? Hippocrates and Aristotle because they were the leading voices on nature in Paul's day. Let's just throw up the first quote by Hippocrates. This is awesome. <laughs> Hippocratic authors hold that hair is hollow and grows primarily from either male or female reproductive fluid or semen flowing into it and congealing. Give me the next quote by Hippocrates. Since hollow body parts create a vacuum and attract fluid, hair attracts semen. <laughs> Appropriately, the term refers not only to hair, but also arms or suckers of the cuttlefish. <laughs> hair grows most prolifically from the head because the brain is the place where the semen is produced, or at least stored. This is Hippocrates. Keep going. Give me another quote by Hippocrates. Hair grows only on the head of prepubescent, so this is prepuberty, prepubescent humans because semen is stored in the brain and the channels of the body have not yet been become large enough for reproductive fluid to travel throughout the body. Keep going. My favorite one's coming up. At puberty, secondary hair growth in the pubic area marks the movement 
of reproductive fluid from the brain to the rest of the body. Women have less body hair, not only because they have less semen, <laughs> but, on, but also because their colder bodies do not froth the semen <laughs> throughout their bodies, but reduce semen evaporation at the ends of their hair. Let's keep going. Didn't ever thought you'd think about frothing semen, did you? Uh, give me the one by Aristotle. This is Aristotle. Like Aristotle, the person who like taught Socrates and Plato, the man who tutored Alexander the Great. Aristotle. The nature of men is to release or eject the semen. During intercourse, semen has to fill all the hollow hairs on its way from the male brain to the genital area. Thus, men have their hair growth on their face, chest, and stomach. A man with hair on his back reverses the usual position of intercourse. <laughs> Woo! A man with long hair retains much or all of his semen. And his long, hollow hair draws the semen towards his head area, but away from his general area where it should be ejected. Who's that a quote from? Aristotle. Not some crackhead down the street. <laughs> Aristotle. Like father of modern philosophy. Aristotle. Like we should trust what this man has to say. Aristotle. Like Paul is intelligent for knowing what Aristotle has to say. So when Paul says, hey women, Cover your head when you come into church. It would be the same as me saying, hey, we're not going to have topless Sunday. <laughs> we're not going to do that. Just, I, know, I know there's some churches that are doing topless Sunday. <laughs> we're not going to have topless worship here. <laughs> because in this culture, in this cultural context, hair is the place where semen is stored. Hair is a sexual reproductive organ in their cultural context. For me to just let the Bible say what the Bible wants to say and not tell you what Aristotle or Hippocrates actually says to give context would be irresponsible on my part. You see how now that you have, it changes everything about this passage of scripture. Let's do one more. We could do this all night. <laughs> is anyone getting the gist? Like, this is every page of the Bible. This is why you can't just like flip it open and be like, what's the Holy Spirit saying to me? <laughs> let's think about this. Let's just, like, let's just be smart for like a minute. Have you ever tried to read Shakespeare? Easy or hard? And you guys are speaking the same language with only two to 300 years of history separating you from the author. The biblical texts are written in Hebrew and Greek with thousands of years separating you from the author. What leads you to think that you can just pick it up as long as the Holy Spirit's talking to me? Maybe not. Maybe what we need to deconstruct is a teenage version of how to read the Bible. Maybe what your youth pastor taught you, which is Pat, pick a scripture and ask the Holy Spirit what it means to you. Maybe that was cool when you were 15. But maybe that's not going to cut it at 27. Maybe just like everything else in life, you leave things in the season in which they were effective. Because a shovel is not a bad thing. It's just a bad thing if I need a rake. A rake isn't bad. It's just bad if I need a shovel. A rake is not bad or good. It's appropriate in the fall. A shovel is appropriate in the winter. The way you read the Bible as a teenager was appropriate when you were 13. But maybe, just maybe, it's going to require something different of you now that you're thinking about, I don't know, marriage, being a parent, leadership. Maybe there's a new season where you didn't think to yourself, I should probably consult Hippocrates on this one. But actually, that's the most logical thing to do. Because the moment we put it in, 
you're no longer angry at Paul. Come on, can we be honest? How many women you walk, you, you've just been angry at Paul for years. He's been like, this jerk <laughs> telling women not to talk in church. We can release you of like all that church hurt. <laughs> you've got all this church hurt from a dude you never met. Some guy named Paul. Come on, let's do one more. This is fun. <laughs> let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. I'm going to read fast. I got about five minutes left. Who's learned something tonight? Has this been helpful for anybody? It's been beneficial? Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. Everybody say shepherds. shepherds. Keeping watch over their flocks at night, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. This will be a sign to you. Who are the angels talking to? They're talking to who? Shepherds. They're talking to, a shep to shepherds in a specific town known as Bethlehem. Now, here's what you all need to know about Bethlehem. Because without context, this doesn't actually make much sense. It makes sense, but you don't get the full punch of what the pastor is actually trying to say. Bethlehem was responsible for one thing. All of the shepherds in Bethlehem had one responsibility. They had a responsibility to produce lambs and sheep that were unblemished and with no bones broken to get sacrificed a couple of miles away, about six miles away, in the temple of Jerusalem. So every shepherd in Bethlehem, one job. Produce sheep with no spots, no blemishes, no broken bones, so that the priests in where? Jerusalem can use them for sacrifice in the temple. One job. You know how hard it is to keep a lamb from getting a blemish? I don't know if there's any parents in the room. For two years and three months, I've done a really good job of keeping this little human alive. He's called my son. He just wanders off, puts weird things in his mouth. I mean, they, my wife went on a retreat couple weeks ago he came my wife came back she's like how does leg get cut up I was like because he was being a kid you know how hard it is to keep a lamb from getting blemished or bones broken very difficult you want to know what you have to do to a lamb to keep it blemish free and keep it from getting bones broken you have to wrap it up in swaddling cloths so when these shepherds from Bethlehem who have been wrapping lambs in swaddling cloths their whole life, get a message from some angels that you're going to go to a cave and there's going to be a sign that only you guys will understand. They walk into the cave and what do they see? They see a child who's been born to die. They see a child who's been born to be a sacrificial lamb for a nation of people who have sinned against God. And what is that baby wrapped up in? That child is wrapped in swaddling cloths. The same exact cloths that they've been using for centuries to keep lambs from getting blown blemishes to keep lambs from getting their bones broken. Mary and Joseph have gotten swaddling cloths to protect this new baby because the Savior of the world cannot have any blemishes and his bones can't be broken because he has to be the perfect sacrifice for you and for me. And when you read the Bible in context, it's like going from black and white to full color. The Bible in context actually makes you want to love God more. The Bible in context. We could literally do this on every page of the Bible. Every single page. So number one, why is the Bible so difficult? Because it wasn't written to you. Here we go, is it worth it? I'll tell you my story. I repented from narcissus. God, what does this mean to me? I moved to England for nine months, and I read the Bible five times in a nine-month period. 
It's funny because on the way to England, I was really struggling with a pornography addiction. It's like I just could not stop. It was like compulsive. Just pornography problem. We dismissed the Pharisees earlier, so you're not going to judge me. Planet Fitness, no judgment zone. In my whole Christian life, I just focused on what to not do. Come on, how many people can relate? The more you focus on what to not do, you end up doing the thing that you're focused on not doing because you're focused on doing the thing that you're trying to not do. It's like the most vicious cycle to be caught in. And then, instead of focusing on what to not do, I began to eat the scroll. Just consume the book. In order to read the Bible five times in nine months, I had to start with Matthew and just read Matthew five times. Then read Mark five times. Then read Luke five times. Never asking, what does this mean to me? What is the original audience? What is the original message to the original audience? You want to know what breaks the curse of like pornography and masturbation? Focusing on other people. Because pornography is selfish in its nature. You can't read the Bible selfish and think that you're going to break the curse of selfishness off of you that is coming out in other areas of your life. If you are objectifying people, you will also objectify God. God, I'm going to use you and you'll become a means to an end. I stopped asking, what does this mean to me? And I just began to figure out What does it mean in context? First month went by. Second month went by. Third month went by. Fourth month went by. My accountability partner said, hey, you haven't checked in with me about, you know, pornography. And I said, you want to know something crazy? He said, wait, wait, wait. How long have I been here? I haven't watched porn in four months. Not only have I not watched porn, I haven't thought about watching porn. This is the first time I've even thought about not doing this in months because instead of focusing on what I should not do, I just focused on what I should be doing. I just put myself on a diet of God's word and I fed myself the scriptures in context in a healthy way. Food is not just food. There's a big difference between McDonald's and some organic food. When I moved to the South, I gained a lot of weight. But it's because Southerners and like other people, they eat the same stuff, but they cook it different. (laughs) Southerners also eat spinach. They just like fry it first. You wanna know what I watch a lot of young adults do? It's like you read the Bible, you just fry it first. You just dip it in a nice batch of narcissism. I don't care what it means to the original audience. I don't care what Paul meant. I don't care what Hippocrates has to say. I really don't care. Which means you don't care about God's message. That's what you mean. Is it worth the work? Yeah. Guess what? Month five hit. Month six hit. Month seven. Month eight. Month nine. I looked up a year later, hadn't watched pornography in a year. Why? Because as long as I was focused on what not to do, I could never break the stronghold of sin. But the moment I just focused on consuming the word, sin became very easy to defeat. Because your Bible will either keep you from sin or sin will keep you from your Bible. Is it worth the work? I can stand here as a living testament and say, yes, it's worth the work. Yeah, am I going to have to study more? Yeah, am I, I going to have to like do some things that I'm not used to doing when I sit down and open the Bible? Yeah. Is it worth it? Yes. It's so worth it that I read my Bible five times in nine months, moved back to America, and was like, I ain't got enough. I need a master's degree. After the master's degree, I was like, yeah. I still don't know everything I want to know. And I'm in a doctoral program right now. Because reading and dedicating my life to this book is the best thing I've ever done. Because the point of the Bible is not to read the Bible. The Bible is the only book where the point of the book is to get to know the author of the book. And I can't say that I love God 
and not love his word. I write my son letters because that's cute. He can't read yet, but one day he's going to be able to read. So he'll be like, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, and he'll be able to read. Every time I go to a new city, I get like a postcard from Denver, and I'll like write him like a little note, and he's got like this stack of them now. You want, when, he, when he's like my age one day, and he reads those letters from his dad, if those letters make him cry, it's not because he loves the postcards. It's because he loves his dad. The reason that I'll dedicate my life to figuring out the original context of scripture so that I can understand scripture is not because I love a book. It's not because I love history. It's not because I love learning. It's not because I love degrees. It's because I love my dad. I love my father. And he went through a lot of effort to make sure that we have a a way to understand truth. Last question. Is the Bible a reliable source of truth? (laughs) Absolutely. By every secular account, the manuscripts that we have that have produced the Bible are what we call early manuscripts. They're early, which means the people writing lived close enough to the events that they are to be considered historically accurate. Early. We have an early witness. It's not like we have an account of the resurrection of Jesus 300 years after it happened. No, it's early. Second, we have eyewitness accounts. Third, we have embarrassing testimony. If the Bible were fabricated, guess what wouldn't be in there? David would not have told us that he killed a man named Uriah and then took his wife named Bathsheba. That would be conveniently omitted. Moses, when writing the first five books of the Bible, would not have told us about the Egyptian that he killed. All the worst stories of every single person is in there written by the people that lived through the experience. So number one, we have early testimony. Number two, we have eyewitness testimony. Number three, we have embarrassing testimony. Why would I fabricate a book and then make myself look really bad? Doesn't make a lot of sense. Number four, we have excruciating testimony, which means the authors of the Bible went through pain in order to defend the fact that it was a reliable source of truth. If the disciples had like just hid Jesus' body, like he didn't really raise from the dead, but they like just hid his body in like Thomas' backyard. I think that when the Romans showed up to crucify Peter upside down, he may have would have just given up the secret. But all 12 disciples go to the grave defending that they saw the risen Savior. They went to the Colosseums, got eaten by lions with one truth in their mouth. We believe what we saw with our eyes, that there was a man who died and he rose again on the third day. And that man named Jesus said that all of the scriptures were true and pointed to him, which means if the resurrection is true, then the life of Jesus is true. And if the life of Jesus is true, then the words of Jesus is true. And if the words of Jesus are true, then he upholds the truth truth of the entire Bible. Jesus, out of his own mouth, says that every book of the Old Testament points to him and is a reliable source of truth. Number five, not only do we have early testimony, eyewitness testimony, embarrassing testimony, excruciating testimony, we have expectant testimony that there are prophecies all throughout the Old Testament that prophesy where Jesus is going to be born. No way for Jesus Jesus to manipulate where he's going to be born. Where he was going to die. No way to manipulate where you're going to die. How he was going to die. Details down to where he would live, miracles he would do, even if he had a list of of all the prophecies and tried to do them all. Most of them are out of his control like what tribe he would be born to. And last, we have extra biblical testimony that historians like Tacitus and Josephus declare that Jesus was a real person, a real man in history, and that people were running around in the first century claiming that he died 
but didn't stay dead. That there was a whole group of people willing to die for the truth that there was a man who had come back from the dead. And that when he came back from the dead, he was on a road to Emmaus and he opened up the scriptures to them and showed them post-resurrection that every single thing in the Bible was about him. Right before I took my first job as a youth pastor, I had an older guy come up to me. He had been a youth pastor for 25 years. His name is Dr. Paul Borthwick. He said, Manny, he was in his probably 60s at the time. He was like, Manny, promise me one thing. And he, it was one of those weird ones where he made me promise it before he told me what he was going to promise. I never liked those. I'm like, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. He's like, promise me one thing. I said, yeah, what? He said, no, you have to promise first. I said, yeah, I, I promise. Promise me you'll never get people to fall in love with Jesus. I was like, that's a weird one. I feel like that's my, my job. He was like, no, you don't understand. If they fall in love with Jesus, they can fall out of love with Jesus. They can create their own version of Jesus in their head and fall in love with an idol instead of falling in love with the actual Jesus. Instead, Manny, make a promise. Get people to fall in love with the Bible because the Bible's about Jesus. And if they fall in love with the Bible, they'll always fall in love with Jesus. If they fall in love with the Bible, Genesis will point them to Jesus. If they fall in love with the Bible, Exodus will point them to Jesus. If they fall in love with the Bible, the prophets will point them to Jesus. If they fall in love with the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will point them to Jesus. If they fall in love with the Bible, then Paul, all throughout the letters, will point them to Jesus. We don't fall in love with Jesus by singing songs about him. We don't fall in love with Jesus. By getting your emotions stirred, here's how you fall in love with Jesus. By getting you to fall in love with the scriptures. If you fall in love with the scriptures, guess what will happen? Number one, you'll actually overcome sin. And, and second, you'll have a deep abiding love, not for your version of God, but for the God of the Bible. I need a good amen in church. All right. I'm over time, I need to go. Anybody, this is helpful. You're like, you know what? That was the nerdiest thing I've ever done in church, but that was actually pretty dang cool. Like, come on, wave at me if that's you. I wanna give you an invitation. What if I told you what we just did, you could do yourself every day? What if I told you that the experience that we just had, like, you could do that? In 2020, we had a bunch of young adults leave our church. Not only did I jump into a doctoral program, but I started a ministry called ARMA. Everybody say ARMA. It's Latin for armor. Paul says to put on the full armor of God. And that includes the sword of the spirit. And I began to realize in the middle of 2020 that if I preach to people, they'll eat that day. But if I start a platform to teach people how to read the Bible for themselves, they'll be able to feed themselves forever. We started this platform in my garage with nothing. Today, over 3,500 people pay us $13 a month to learn the Bible for themselves. Every single month we put out a brand new course. Our courses are like three hours, but every session is 12 minutes. The first part, when we did women not talking in church, I pulled that straight out of our women in ministry course. The second one about hair, I pulled that straight out of our Corinthian course. And the last one about Jesus and the swaddling clothes and the shepherds, I pulled that out of our Luke course. Every month we drop a brand new course. Here's the first question. Why is the Bible so hard? Because you don't understand context. Well, let me give you some good news. I would love to teach you context. I would actually love to teach you context for 12 minutes every single day. Is it worth it? Oh, it's worth it. Maybe you've thought to yourself, one of these days it'd be cool to go to seminary and waste like $50,000. I'm not joking, that's a waste of money. Here's what I decided in the middle of the pandemic. I can give every single human being on the planet 
seminary level education for $13 every month. That's called access. I grew up my whole life never having a black Bible professor. My dad took me to a crack house when I was five years old. My mother was pregnant at 12. I grew up without access to biblical teaching, theological education. Because guess what? Theology is a space owned by old white men. I have made it black and cool and cheap. Nobody has an excuse why you should not do this. I want to give you an invitation. How about you join 3,500 other people that have realized that putting scripture in context has changed their life forever. I was at a church in San Diego. I went two years in a row. The first year, I invited everyone to become an Armour subscriber. The second year, this huge black dude who was a bodyguard for Suge Knight. If you're a bodyguard for Suge Knight, you're a big person. Just grabbed me and hugged me, picked me up. I was like, you need to put me down. But I said it nice because he was big. And he was like, man, I love you. And I was like, you don't know me. And he was like, I do. I listen to you for 12 minutes every day. Last year you were at my church and I made a decision that changed my life forever. I canceled my Netflix subscription and I got an Armour subscription. For the first time in my life, I can say I'm biblically literate. And he quoted Hippocrates and Aristotle to me. And I was like, dang, bro, you ain't kidding. I would love for you to become an Armour subscriber tonight. Everybody's got 13 bucks, but here's the real challenge. Everyone has 12 minutes. Everybody. For most of us, you spend 12 minutes tick, tock, tick, tock. Tick tock is not the place to learn the Bible, neither is YouTube. I want to provide a way for you to actually learn the Bible. You can throw up a QR code. If you get subscribed tonight, I'll put a free gift in your hands. You'll get this book by A.W. Tozer that changed my life when I was in college. And the first 25 people to subscribe, I'll give you two free gifts. Not only will I give you The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer, but I'll give you this book, How to Read the Bible, book by book. Radically changed my life. Both books have changed my life. First 25 subscribers, scan that QR code, get signed up, you'll get two gifts. Everybody else, sorry, I only got one book for you. Get signed up quick. If you need help getting signed up, we got laptops out in the lobby for you. Our courses are about three hours, new course every single month. Right now, there are about 40 courses on the platform. We've been at this for about three years. I would love to help you learn the Bible. Every single page of scripture, if it's out of context, then you don't know what it's saying. I would love to put the Bible in context for you. Who's in? Who's saying, you know what, Pastor Manny? I'm in. I got 12 minutes. I got 13 bucks. I'm in. I'm going to do this. I'm going to actually take this seriously. If I got questions, I need to get those answers, and I'm in. I actually want to learn the Bible from you. Come on, let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that there have been martyrs in history that have died so that we can get the scriptures. Martin Luther risked his life translating the Bible in common vernacular. Martyrs fed to lions so that we can hold this book. My wife smuggled Bibles into China, saw Christians in the underground church ripping pages out of Scripture, memorizing a full page. Here we are in America. We've got the whole Bible and we don't even read it. We don't take it seriously. God, we repent. Sorry for reading the Bible and not letting the Bible read us. God, I ask that tonight that there would be a supernatural love for the Bible that gets imparted from me to the rest of the room. God, we did a lot of studying tonight, a lot of learning, but I ask that you would have spoken to every single person's heart, not just their mind. Maybe they've got a Bible that they don't even use, they don't even read. God, would you help us to be students of your word tonight? God, we ask that everything that I said tonight would not have fallen on deaf ears, but that it would get on good soil and that it would produce a harvest 30, 60, and 100 fold. God, we declare that millennials are going to love you. Our generation is not lost. We declare that Gen Z is going to love you and love your word. We're not just going to deconstruct into oblivion. You don't just love us, you love the church. 
So God, we ask that we would be a group of young adults committed to truth, committed to the scriptures, and committed to the local church. We declare that our best days are ahead of us, not behind us. It's in your name we pray. Come on, and we all say together, amen, 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 amen. Hey, if you get signed up for Armor tonight, I'll be in the lobby ready to greet you. How about we stand up on our feet? Let's worship together. Come on, let's go out with some praise. I love you, Red Rocks.